ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानाजनशलाकया चक्षुरोन्मी तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनोपीष्ट स्थापित ये नूतले स्वयं रूप कदा मह्यम ददाति स्वदाति वंदेह श्रीगुरश्रीयुतापदकमल श्रीगुर वैष्णवांश श्रीरूप साग्र जात सा घन रघुनाथ तम से जीव साइत सवधूत पिजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य देव श्री राधा कृष्ण पादान सागन मिलता श्री विशाकांश नम विष्णुदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नितनाम नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शुनिवाद पाश्चातकल्पतरूप्य कृपा सिंधूप पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवासदी गौरभक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो वेलकम बैक एंड कमेंसिंग द ट्वेल्थ चैप्टर ऑफ द भगवदगीता टुडे सो एज ऑलवेज वी विल बिगिन विद द वर्ड्स by sri pad yamunacharya which summarizes the 12th chapter and then go into the verses and um, once again i'll focus on those aspects of sri pad ramanacharya's commentary which is slightly different than uh, you know what we have learned from bhagavad gita as it is there is a lot of overlap there are many things that uh, uh, sri pad ramanacharya says which is again what shila prabhu pad talks about in bhagavad gita as it is so i'll point out those similarities briefly but main we will look at the differences in fact some verses are uh, explained uh, very differently here so but i mean the spirit of bhakti yoga is only there but uh, the explanation is worth uh, study <clears throat> so we'll start with uh, the verse of uh, yamuna charya where he summarizes this chapter bhakte shreshtam upoyukta asaktasya atma nishtita tat prakara tu ati priti bhakte dwadasha uchyate so yamunachary says bhakte shreshtam the first the, there are the five topics in the 12th chapter are the first is bhakte shreshtam the greatness of bhakti over what over atma upasana meditation on the atma <coughs> i'll tell what that is uh, upoyukta the means to bhakti so first is bhakti shreshtam how bhakti is superior second is how to achieve bhakti uh third is atma upasana uh, so that is also been spoken how atma upasana is performed atma nai atma nishtata asaktasya by one who is incapable of performing bhakti so such people do that tat prakara the attributes needed to perform karma yoga and uh, bhakte ati priti the boundless love that krishna has for his devotee these are all the topics in the 12th adhyay right so it begins with this the greatness of bhakti over uh, bhagwan so so five topics as we saw here so we'll get into the verses without spending further time arjuna vacha evam satata yukta e bhaktastvam paryupasate ye chaapyaksharam avyaktam tesham ke yoga vittamah arjuna is as as this as described in the manner by you the bhaktas who desire to continuously be united with you worship you who is endowed with all your incredible infinite glories and possessing innumerable auspicious qualities and there are those who meditate on the imper- imperishable essential nature of the jivatma who is beyond the perception of the external sense organs between these two type of yogis who will reach their goal faster okay so this is a question he is asking okay so to give a background since this chapter begins with evam evam actually means thus since it begins with thus uh, the connection is in the 11th chapter in the end krishna had said that by bhakti alone he can be understood okay so because he said that uh, he arjuna is beginning this chapter by asking thus as described by you the bhaktas who desire to continuously be united with you so so the first thing is the devotees he is asking the second part na generally we are used to understanding echa pekshara mavyaktam those who worship the impersonal brahman that is how we have learned uh, from bhagavad gita as it is uh, shla propad's translation and commentary the difference here he is saying is 
Aksharam Avyaktam, he talks about it as those who meditate on the imperishable essential nature of Jivatma. So why is this? That, so it's, it's basically the same thing. But the point here is that those who are aspiring for Kaivalya Mukti, they essentially meditate on the Atma only. Uh, there is nothing like a Brahman on which they meditate. They actually meditate. Their process is to meditate on the self. They meditate on themselves only, the Atma. Or they meditate on the imperishable essential nature of the Jivatma, Aksharam. Aksharam means they meditate on the Atma which is infallible, who is beyond the perception of external senses, etc. So, like we also, we have, I'm sure all of us have also heard this that those who get Sayuja Mukti or this Kaivalya Mukti, what do they do in the Brahman? It's not that. Though they are merged in the Brahman, they are not meditating on any Brahman per se. They are actually meditating on focusing on their own nature, the Atma. So that is how Sripad Ramanuchare describes here that uh, this Aksharam Abhyaktam, he basically talks about it as those who meditate on the Jivatma. And the connection that he brings out is that in the seventh chapter, if you recall, in 7.16, Krishna had spoken about four types of uh, people, right, who approach him. Artho, Jignasur, Artharthi, Jnani, Chaparatarshapa. So if you recall, we had made it into three categories, the four. Uh, the Artho and Artharthi, we had put them as Aishwarya Kami, you know, those who want Aishwarya in this world. Then there is the Jignasu. The Jignasu is the this Kaivalya, you know, the one who is interested in impersonal monistic liberation. And then the final, the jnani, the word jnani that Krishna uses is actually a bhakta, right? Because it gets clarified later. Krishna says, Eka bhaktir vishishyate. The jnani is actually the bhakta. That means one who by knowledge has come to Krishna. So in this way, Krishna has spoken about this already before. And that is essentially what Arjuna is asking. Now, of course, it is very clear that those who are aspiring for Aishwarya, they are certainly, you know, within this material world only. But then the other two who are there, the transcendental is one who is Kaivalya Kami, who wants Kaivalya liberation, and one who wants Bhagavan himself. Now, the interesting thing is both of these people worship Krishna only. Eh? Please remember. So, even when we say impersonalist, his goal is the Jivatman. He may be meditating on the Jivatman as well, but he also does Bhakti. Okay, so just like we know this point, right? That those who are impersonalists also. They meditate on Krishna or they use bhakti as a tool for their goal. Uh, because uh, it is very dry, right? Just to meditate on the Jivatma. So they also use bhakti. But bhakti is not the end for them. It is just a means to reach the Kaivalya Mukti. So that is why, uh, please note, in connect, this verse has to be seen in connection with 7.16 Bhagavad Gita. Uh, where that uh, Jignasu who is there, that Jignasu is the monist, the Kaivalya Kami. Though he wants Kaivalya, he wants Kaivalya liberation and he also does meditate on the, uh, the Aksharam, uh, that is the nature of Atma, etc. But he also does some Bhakti, but his Bhakti is not uh, Shuddha Bhakti, or his Bhakti is not the Bhakti with the desire to attain Bhakti itself. But it is just used as a tool, you know, to attain whatever he wants. So, so this point is important to uh, clarify here because this verse has to be seen in that, right? So, Aksharam is the pure Atma freed from matter and impersonalist. So, both are doing Bhakti and uh, Krishna, Arjuna is asking Krishna to compare them. Of course, the difference is one is doing Bhakti as the goal itself and one is doing Bhakti as only the means. His goal is something different. Right. And of course, he also does his impersonal meditation, uh, which is this Aksharam of Yukta. So, so, so that is how Shripad Ramanacharya defines here. Okay, so, 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 so he's asking Krishna to compare these two. Okay, so please remember when we, when he's asking Krishna to compare, it is not just in terms of the goal, because it is very clear, right? From goal perspective, Bhakti's goal is Krishna only, which Krishna has already said in 6.47 Bhagavad Gita. Yoginam api sarvesha madgate rantaratmana. He has already said that my devotee, basically, the, the one who focuses on me, you know, he is the highest. So, 
So in terms of goal, bhakti is only greatest that has already been clarified. Correct? So here he is asking from the perspective of uh, the practice, the path, etc. And that is how Krishna's answer is going to be. Krishna is going to answer basically uh, how, you know, from the practice and the path perspective, which is superior. From the goal perspective, bhakti is uh, superior has already been announced in 6.47. Right? But now from the path perspective, uh, Krishna is going to answer. And Pariupasate. So Pariupasate means worshipping Krishna completely. Okay? Like that. And so, so basically he wants to know Tamaha. So, you know, so this word which is there, na, Yoga with Tama. So there is Taraha and there is Tama. Here this Tama is not Tamoguna. Tara means superior and Tama means most superior among them. Okay, so K Yoga with Tamaha. You know, this word last which is there, na, who will reach the goal fastest or who is most perfect? You know, that is the question that is being asked, right? So now let's go into the answers. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Maya Vesha Manoyama Nitya Yukta Upasate Shadya Pariopeta Steme Yukta Tamamataha. Bhagavan Sri Krishna replied, Those who are desire of, of constantly being united with me alone and endowed with great faith, focusing their mind exclusive on me, considering me as the supreme goal to be attained, worship me with love. I consider them to be the topmost excellent yogis who will achieve their goal of attaining me speedily with no exertion. Okay, so here again, the translation is very, very similar to what Shla Prabhupada says. So there's one or two points I'll say here. So Ramanuja says that, yes, it's where Krishna has made it very, very clear that one who thinks of Lord is constant is better. Hmm? Of course, the Kaivalyarthi is also thinking about the Lord. But the thing is here, because it is his goal. Uh, it is his goal. So, uh, so, so that is why um, if you see the, the translation, exclusively focusing their mind exclusively on me, Krishna says. Why exclusively, he says? Because that Kaivalya Kami, he is also focusing on Krishna, but not exclusively. He uses it only as one part of his sadhana. So he is not exclusively focusing. So that is the only point here to be uh, highlighted. Anyway, let's go ahead now. Now in the next three verses, Krishna will explain why the Kaivalyarthi who is there, his path is more difficult. And so that is the explanation. Here this explanation is slightly different. So we will spend some time on it. Etuaksharam anirdesham avyaktam paryupasate sarvatrakam chintyam cha kutastam achalam druvam. However, those who meditate on the imperishable jivatma that exists in each body, but it is inconceivable as it is completely different from the nature of such bodies. That is of common nature irrespective of the type of body it takes and never undergoes any modifications to its nature, remains immutable, remains eternal and immutable, which cannot be described through words like man, god, animal, thing, etc. and cannot be comprehended through sense organs. Okay, so the verse doesn't get completed here, but anyway, we will uh, look at this. So the point here... Uh, Prabhu, can I ask something in between? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Proji, you know, if you go to the previous verse, you know, the, you know, where Krishna speaks, yes. So here, actually, uh, you know, Prabhupada also writes this and, uh, you know, here also, you know, focusing mind exclusively on me. Yeah. So, you know, Prabhupada says on my, you know, personal form. Yeah. So Prabhupada translates, who fix their minds on my you know, personal form. And here, it's right, it's focusing on me. So, the Mayavadis or other, uh, you know, Sampradayas who are Brahmavadis, they say that the the word personal is uh, an uh, addition. And uh, here also, it sees like, worship me with love. So, so how do you see that? You will have to go back to the question itself. So, Arjuna's question is crystal clear, na? Evam satate yuktaya bhakta stvam paryupasate, focusing on you. Paryupasate, again, see, paryupasate means what? If you remember, I said, paryupasate means from all perspectives doing upasana. Upasate means to worship. Paryupasate means from all perspectives worshipping Krishna. That means completely dedicated to worshipping Krishna. Tvam and evam. Evam means what does. So, Evam ka apko kida se dekhna padega 11.55 Bhagavad Gita. 
what was the previous verse krishna had said that the only by bhakti to me i can be known completely so it is very clear right arjuna's question is in the context of 11.55 and krishna's answer is very clear i mean whether you have the word personally or you don't have it is very clear krishna is referring to him only and because the other okay. alternative is also there right see this whole 12th chapter discussion is about the path of direct bhakti and the path of kaivalya marga so that is what arjuna is asking so there is nothing else other than these two because aishwarya has already been rejected arjuna is not yeah, even but, you know they say that within krishna so how do you reject within krishna supreme within krishna how do you reject that reject within krishna means i don't understand uh, you know for example they say that one who worships that supreme who is within krishna they say like that i got it see when the direct meaning is there you see to take an indirect meaning there is more effort actually see the whole mm. thing is anybody who says that they will be at pains to justify what they are saying because if you see the gita till now it is very clear when krishna says me it is me only ra where is this within krishna coming from so see when krishna is saying mom or when arjuna is saying tvam it is very clear and if you want the impersonal op- option that option has already been separately mentioned so the point is you can't take double both options as impersonalism right this whole chapter has begun with arjuna talking about the kaivalya marga and the bhagavad bhagavat marga so there are only two margas by and large right i mean if you talk from mm-hmm. perspective the aishwarya has already been now nobody speaking about it so yeah if you have already brought in uh, kaivalya marga then in bhagavat marga also how can you bring kaivalya into that then it's kaivalya or kaivalya so that that doesn't make any sense so and also the yeah, is very clear right so i know prabhupad says person me personally as a person and all that that is to emphasize to hit on it but even if that is not there here for example personally is not written it is only written in me because mai krishna is saying me so me is me only na how can you twist it So those who twist hmm. it will have to explain further. I mean, otherwise the meaning is crystal clear to anyone who knows basic Sanskrit. Also. Correct. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, good. Yeah. So going ahead, see. So here, what happens now? Now, see. Now again, here Ramanujacharya's commentary is slightly different because uh, Ramanujacharya, what he does is he explains this third verse as the path of the impersonalist. This Kaivalya now, their path is to meditate on the Jivatma. okay like if you see even in the 6th chapter or if you see in patanjali yoga sutra also these people talk about the impersonal meditation which is to sit down control all the senses and focus on the atma okay focus on the imperishable jivatma aksharam paryupasate okay so uh, so 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 that is one slight difference because uh, so here propad he talks about uh, you know the impersonal conception of the absolute but that impersonal conception of the absolute is this only this meditating on the shuddha jivatma so that is what this person is so that is one difference here but in ramana jare's commentary and proverbs uh, gita as it is so he says that uh, these people uh, and how he explains it we will see that sarvatragam achintyam sarvatragam achintyam means they exist in every body but it is inconceivable achintyam why it is called as why the jivatma itself is called achintyam is because you can't give any example in this world to understand the jivatma so ramanujare says that see you cannot take any example of the the material world to refer to him okay so that is why he is called even as anirdeshyam look at that word anirdeshyam anirdeshyam means he cannot be described through any word that we know right the jivatma is none of the things that we see in this world okay so like that and then for example he uses the word kutastham kuta now again this word kuta has been very nicely explained by him so he says kuta is actually a big stone which is traditionally used by a blacksmith and on that stone what happens is the knife is beaten and different different shapes of knives are made a blacksmith or some such person will have a big stone and on that stone he will beat and make various vessels knives and spoons and various things he will make though he makes all those things we using the steel and iron on uh, iron on top of that kuta the kuta itself doesn't change because that stone is uh, you know not changing at all 
only the form of what is made on top of the stone keeps changing. So he so he says kotastam means so why the jivatma is kotastam because the jivatma is not changing only. Using on the framework of the jivatma, different different bodies are there. Sometimes human, sometimes animal, sometimes bird, whatever. Right, but the jivatma is unchanging, like the kuta. So that is why kuta is there. So it's a very good example. Right, achalam is not undergoing any modifications. Druam eternally is remaining the same. Abhyaktam cannot be comprehended very easily through the sense organs. Doesn't move. So, so basically, Ramana Chari says all these attributes which are given here are attributes of this jivatma which is imperishable. And this is what that Kaivalya um, Kami, he is focusing on. So please remember, he is focusing on Krishna also because he does some bhakti. But, main, his main, he, but he meditates on this. And this is his goal. He wants to achieve this. He wants to achieve a state where he is just focusing on Jivatma, on himself. And that is what we call as Brahman realization. Right, he he's, he's merged in that so called in the Brahman, but but then he is not meditating on any Brahman per se. He is just focusing on himself sitting there. So that this is his path. He uses a bhakti as an aid, uh, but not completely. So so th his main uh, piece of sadhana is this one, and Krishna elaborates that in the next verse. So in the next verse, what Krishna does is in the twelve point three, Krishna speaks about the characteristics of the jivatma. And in 12.4, Krishna speaks about how he does upasana. Okay, look at that. Sanyam yendri agramam sarvatra samabuddhaya te prapnuvanti mameva sarvabhuta hiterataha. Completely subduing their sense organs, considering all sentient beings as equal, and always being devoted to the welfare of others, such persons attain the essential nature of jivatma, who is similar to my own self. Now, see here again, there is a slight uh, difference in the commentary. I'll just tell you this. Because here Krishna says, na, te prapnuvanti maameva. Okay, now this maameva, now Prabhupada translates this maameva saying that at last they achieve me. Okay, but Ramanajare says, yes, they will achieve him, but they achieve him in what sense? He says they achieve the nature of the jivatma. Because the jivatma is also, that means the, is also one aspect of the Almighty, right? Okay, so when we so so the point is Ramanacharya says this Kaivalya Kami he is not going to enter the spiritual world because he is not even aspiring for it. Why will he enter? He doesn't want to do bhakti only as the goal. He has used bhakti a little bit as the means. He just wants to meditate on the Jivatma and just be situated in that bliss of Jivatma, Ananda, Mayobhyas. You know that understanding that the Jivatma is full of bliss and just be situated in that. So he is also not aspiring to go to the spiritual world. Okay, so so here he says that uh, they, when we say te prapnuvanti maameva, it is a, my nature, you know, my nature, just like how I am, he aspires to be like that, you know, just independent and focused on himself. Okay, so that is his goal. Now again, uh, in, so, so what is this upasana? Sanyam indriyagram. So first thing is he has to control the senses. So that is absolute must. Right, for the kaivalya kami, he has to completely subdue the sense organs. And Sarvatra Samabuddhaya. See, the Samabuddhaya, then uh, Ramanacharya reminds us of 6th chapter Bhagavad Gita. All that whole 6th chapter, if you recall, was about Samabuddhi only. Seeing Samalostra Shmakanchana, right? Then if you go back to the 5th chapter, Brahmane Gavihastini. So, all that, right? So, there are so many verses in the 5th and 6th chapter that talks about Samabuddhi. He has to reach that. So, that is his sadhana, considering everything, controlling his senses, looking at everything equally. And Sarva Bhuta Hite Rataha. So he says, Sarva Bhuta Hite Rataha. Ramanacharya says, Are, what do you mean by Sarva Bhuta Hite Rataha? Okay, so does it mean that he, how can somebody do welfare activity for everybody in this world? And if he's actually doing that, then where will he even get time to do any sadhana and all that? Right? Are, are you getting the point? Because Sarva Bhuta Hite Rataha, if you, if you want to see it, at the extreme uh, limit of its understanding, it means you are really engaged in helping everyone in this world. And if somebody is actually having to do that, he can't focus on his bhakti only. So he says, Sarva Bhute Hitirata, you can also understand it in this way. He doesn't trouble anybody. He doesn't cause any problem for anyone in this world. No animal, no plant, nothing. He doesn't trouble anyone. So then that is also Sarva Bhute That is something he is saying is practical for the Jeevatma. 
more than that he cannot do okay and then uh, you know and, and then they they talk a lot of verses about uh, how uh, the, all the jivatmas are equal so that there is this verse quoted from vishnu puran veru randra vibedena veda sajjati samyuti abeda vyapi no vayu tata so paramatmanah so basically this is a very interesting verse it talks about how uh, it says that suppose somebody is playing a flute when he's playing a flute what does he do he just blows air into the flute like we all know that krishna is a flute he just blowing air into the flute anyone playing a flute is blowing air in the flute but depending on which hole the air comes out from we call it rishabh sadjam or gandharam that means depending on where it comes out from we give it a particular name to it raga so similar so it is not the air that is making the difference but it is the you know from where it comes out so the vishnu puran verse what it says is this atma is like this air which is entering the flute okay so when every atma comes into prakriti every atma is the same only but some comes out in a demigod body some comes out in animal body some comes in a human body like that so it's a very interesting verse that talks about so so this is a verse that is quoted in the vishnu puran to tell us that Look at everyone equally because everyone is like that air which is blown into the flute. Just based on the hole, they are producing different different sounds. So anyway, so such many such things are there in the scriptures, which talk about uh, how this uh, uh, the, the the entire path of the Kaivalya Kami, right? And this Kaivalya Kami, he achieves the impersonal liberation, whatever. So as I told you here, there is a slight difference. Proper translates this as "at last achieves me," uh, but uh, here he goes ahead and says that his me is uh, the Kaivalya Moksha. The Kaivalya Moksha is that me because the Kaivalya Moksha is also Krishna only. So that is and that is his aspiration. So he gets it. Okay. Now Krishna in the fifth verse he makes the comparison. Okay. Plesho adhikaraste sham abhyakta satya teja sam abhyakta hi gatir bhukham. they have at bira vaapte so it is extremely difficult for them to focus their mind on the jeevatman who is beyond the range of the sense organs thus the contemplation of the imperceptible jeevatman by embodied beings who have been considering that the body is the same of jeevatman for an infinitely long time is attained only with great difficulty so here krishna answers actually arjuna's question arjuna had asked na which path is better so one reason so there are only two reasons given in the first part of the 12th chapter one reason is that the impersonal path is very very difficult that is being said here and second reason will be set in 12.7 that for a bhakta i myself deliver him from the cycle of birth and death krishna says that that means the grace of krishna comes in this bhakti process whereas in the kaivalya process it is mainly on one's own one has to reach that So these are the two reasons given by Krishna in the twelfth chapter. One is that it is very difficult to do this type of kaival uh, meditation, and second thing is that Krishna's grace is not available here. Whereas for the direct bhakti path, Krishna's grace is more easily available. So, so that is also. So these are two reasons. But the third reason is that Krishna as the goal is higher than kaival mukti. That is not set in the twelfth chapter because that was already set in six point forty seven. So, if you want to add that reason also, there are three reasons like this why the path of bhakti is the the path of direct bhakti is superior to this kind of thing. But in the twelfth chapter, Krishna is talking about two things. Okay, so klesha, adhikatara, adhikatara, very very difficult. Why? Because we are all we are in this body for such a long time, right? So there is one Vaishnava Acharya who says, "Are Baba a sparrow?" I I didn't realize this, but they say that a sparrow's nest. Cannot be untied by you. How are you going to untie the nest of samsara? Uh, I'm yet to actually kind of find this out. That the sparrow's nest, it seems, it is so complex that no human being can untie it. It seems we can just kind of destroy it, but to untie it completely is almost impossible. That is the dexterity with which the sparrow makes its nest. Okay, so the comparison is. Are sparrows nest only we cannot untie samsara how can you untie it is forget it it is not at all easy for us to do so it is in the sense that this kaivalya marga where one has to do everything by himself primarily focusing on the jeevatman you know contemplating like that very very difficult 
So that is why. So the dukkham here is difficulty. The dukkham. See, generally dukkham means um, some kind of uh, sadness, etc. But here the translation is difficulty. It's great difficulty. One basically it is. So 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 this is the first reason that Krishna is giving why the path of bhakti is superior to the path of kaivalya. Right. Then Krishna goes ahead. And in the sixth and seventh verse, he gives the second reason. Vetu sarvani karmani mai sanyasya matparaha anangye neva yoge na maam jayanta upasate. So it is very clear again. Krishna is talking about the other people. Who are the other people? Those who are the uh, direct worshippers of the Lord, right? He says, Un unlike the worshippers of the Jeevatma who hold me as a supreme goal uh, to be attained, uh, and dedicate all their worldly activities like earning money, etc., and their Vedic activities to me by performing bhakti yoga without having any other motive other than to love me. They adore me by meditating on me, worshipping me, by prostrating, singing my glories, and chanting my name. So, again, this is only this verse is not complete because six and seven are to be seen together. But basically, what happens here is the focus now is how bhakti is more easy. And how uh, you know Krishna's grace is going to come. So the focus Ramanacharya uh, makes on this particular verse is uh, this mai sarvani karmani sanyasya. Okay, so here he does a lot of explanation. He basically says, now in fact, this theme I'm introducing here um, maybe second time, but uh, we're going to see this very elaborately henceforward, especially when we come to the 18th chapter. Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyasa means Ramanacharya says three types of Tyaga one has to do. Okay, he defines them as Kartritva Buddhi Tyaga, Mamata Tyaga, Falatyaga. Okay, so all this was already said in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. We are just recapping it. Kartritva Buddhi Tyaga means I am not the doer. Kartritva Buddhi. Kartritva Buddhi means thinking I am the doer. Kartritva Buddhi Tyaga means I am not the doer. We had already seen this in third and fifth chapter. Right, where Krishna says, You are not the doer, the modes are acting, modes are directed by the Supreme Power. Second is Mamata Tyaga. Mamata Tyaga means this activity itself is not for my pleasure, it is for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Right, it is for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. And third is Falatyaga. The fruits from this activity are not for me. So please remember, there are three things here one is who is the doer. One is the activity is for whose pleasure, the activity itself. And third thing is the fruit of the activity is for whom. Okay, so this is what Ramanacharya, throughout his Gita commentary, he has given a lot of emphasis on all these three. He calls it Kartritva Buddhi Tyaga, Mamata Tyaga and Palatyaga. As I said, and, and we will explore this concept uh, much more detail because the 18th chapter, when we come to that, in great detail, we will be seeing these three once again. So he says, when Krishna is saying here, Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyasya, it means all these three are included. That means you have to do sanyas or giving up of the feeling that I am the doer, the activity is for my pleasure and the fruits are for my pleasure. No, Krishna is the doer, he is using me as an instrument. This activity which I am doing is for his pleasure and the fruits from this activity are also for him. Like that. So he says that this is not only to be done in karma yoga, but it is also to be done in bhakti yoga. That means in bhakti yoga also, if you are chanting, we are doing any bhakti activity, worshipping the deity, whatever, we have to understand that we are not the doer. So in fact, it is there also in deity worship. Those of you who must have started would know that before we start worshipping the deity, you know, sometimes there are these mantras or we are told to meditate that we are sitting there just on the behalf of Guru and doing all this. Basically spiritualizing our senses. Kind of understanding that we are just an instrument sitting there. So, in deity worship such uh, rituals are existing where you uh, you know, you kind of spiritualize your body and meditate that actually I am not doing anything. Krishna is making me do all this worship for him for his own pleasure. And I am just acting as an instrument. So, all these three kind of tyagas when they are done, they are called as Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyasya. So that is what Ramanacharya elaborates this. And Ananyena Yogena means again, uh, this is like bhakti without any other thing. I mean, if you contrast this with that Kaivalya Kami, he also may do some bhakti, but it is not Ananya Yoga. Right? He is doing bhakti, ultimately he wants Kaivalya Mukti. 
but uh, our devotee is not like that. He's doing it like this. So, so like that he says. Okay. And then in the seventh verse, Krishna completes it. Tesha vaham samutthartha mrittu samsara sagara bhavami nachirad partha maya vesita chetasa. Hey Arjuna, son of Krita, of such great bhaktas who have their mind exclusively concentrated on ad adoring me, I become without delay, very quickly uplift them from the ocean of samsara, which is death in itself, as it is an obstruction to attaining me, the Supreme. Okay, so this is again a very similar translation to what Prabhupada has given. Uh, I'll just uh, maybe just tell one thing here that this is a, so, as I said, right, there are only two reasons given here how bhakti is easy. So, okay, we'll just elaborate that. One is that the path itself is very nice. Why it is nice? So, Ramanujari gives an example. He says, because in bhakti, the path and the goal are same. In the path also, there is pleasure. So he says, he gives an example. Suppose a group of Vaishnavas are going to Sri Ranga. Let's say they're traveling together. Even when they're traveling together, the group of Vaishnavas, because they're going to Sri Ranga, even in the path, they are having a very good time. Because they're all friends. They're all discussing about Krishna. And they are all having a good time in the path. So it is not that only when they read Sri Rangam, they are going to feel some... You know, of course, they will feel an extra bliss on reaching the holy place, but that path and the goal are both same. Right? I mean, I'm sure some of us devotees have this experience while like going for a yatra. You know, that going together is only the fun. You know, that itself is the beginning of uh, great pleasure. So, so that is one reason he is giving why bhakti is superior to that Kaivalya Marka because there the path and goal are different. Whereas here the path is the goal. So, it's, that is one reason. And second reason is this what is mentioned in this verse. Krishna is saying that I myself come and uplift them. Aham samudharta, I am going to lift them from this uh, particular thing. So Ramanacharya says the Lord is going to come like Varahadev and how Varahadev lifted Bhumi Devi, the Lord is going to come and lift the devotee and take him back to his abode. And because of that it is superior because the grace of God is there here. Much more profoundly than in the other path. In that other path it is more like by one's endeavor only one has to reach. So, in this way, the first section of the 12th chapter concludes where we have understood that the path of bhakti is superior to the path of Kaivalya for these two reasons. The path itself is jolly and Krishna's grace is also going to come. Whereas there the path is difficult and uh, you know one has to endeavor very hard to achieve it. Kind of so, like that. So these two things are mentioned. Okay. Uh, we'll do this section also from uh, verse number 8 to 12. So, uh, so here, this is again, uh, some of these, uh, the commentary here is slightly different. So, I'll focus on that part as well. Mayeva mana adatsva mai buddhini veshaya niva shishyasi mayeva atavurdhvamna samshaya. Fix your mind on me alone. Develop firm conviction that I alone am the greatest goal to be achieved. When your meditation has been perfected with your mind continuously focused on me, you will become like a muktat mind. You will be together with me without any fear. So that's the translation given by him here. So, uh, yeah, so this is very similar to what uh, Prabhupada says in uh, the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Only one elaboration, why Buddha is mentioned separately, right? If you see in this verse, Mana Adatsva and Buddhi Nivesha. Krishna is saying that fix your mind on me and engage your intelligence also in me. So he says here, buddhi here means the determination. Okay. Mind is the mana, but buddhi has been said in order to say that the determination also must be there, that I have to be fixed on Krishna and I should not go here and there. Kaivalya arti has the determination for Kaivalya, not the Lord directly. Okay. So the Kaivalya arti also may have mana in Krishna, but if buddhi is not in Krishna, please note the difference. I mean, if you go back to 12.1 Bhagavad Gita, Kaivalyarti, even he may have his mind on Krishna once a while. He may do some bhakti and all that. But his buddhi is not in Krishna. His buddhi is in Kaivalya. But here the bhakta is not like that. His determination is also Krishna. He is determined to achieve Krishna and his mind is all in Krishna. Nivashishyasi Mayeva means living in Krishna. So living in Krishna means, he gives an example, just like a child is completely dependent on the mother. You know, like if you see small children, they are very, very jolly, right? They have no botheration only. What is the time, when to eat, when to sleep, from where food will come? Nothing. The best, that's why sometimes childhood is considered the best part of life. Because you don't bother about anything at all. When to drink water, 
generally children if you see carefully they don't even bother to think when i'm going to you know the mother only has to remember are this child has not drunk water since two three hours and the mother takes a glass and goes and gives the child please drink water till then the child will not even do that so completely just relying on the mother i mean as in it's very unconscious the child is not even thinking so much yeah, the mother is going to come and give but in the background the child knows that mother is going to do everything i don't have to worry only went to sleep went to get up nothing no bother is in a car so rahul tell you that is exactly saying that that is what it means by nivashishya simaye that is living in krishna no bother is in about anything he will take care of everything you know, that kind of uh, when one relies on then is not okay so now from 12.9 onwards the translation is slightly different so i will uh, spend some more time on this 9 to 12 ಹೈಯೆ and namana chare says that anybody who ultimately wants to have perfect bhakti must come to 12.8 okay but if you cannot do 12.8 if you are not able to completely live in krishna like that abhyasa yoga in that now how he defines abhyasa slight difference is there generally you know we define abhyasa as regulative principles of bhakti yoga so here what ramana chare says abhyasa means he quotes a verse or a definition of abhyasa alambana samshilanam punah punah abhyasa that means abhyasa means to do something repeatedly okay so what is that repeatedly so he says here see what did krishna ask in 12.8 always think of me now you are not always able to think of krishna or you are not always able to just only sit and meditate on krishna you are by your own nature you want to do 100 other things in the world. so krishna is saying no problem whatever you are doing at that time you think of it. so that is how he defines abhyasa and the abhyasa means he says you have to contemplate on krishna consciously when you are doing anything else. that means what we say na to be krishna conscious that means one is cooking driving uh, walking whatever activity we may do in the background you have to constantly try to you know in the routine root during the routine activities in this world which we do that time also you have to consciously try to repeatedly contemplate upon it. so that is how he defines this abhyas okay, so somebody may say so so what is the advantage of doing it so he says that because the lord is subhashrayam by meditating on him your rajoguna tamoguna will reduce and in this way you will come ultimately where you can now come to 12 point but then somebody may look at this and also say that are even this is difficult so then he comes to this part 12.10 which also is bhakti yoga abhyase pe samarto si mat karma paramo bhava madartam api karvani kurvam siddhi no vapsisi so are incapable of practicing the frequent contemplation with devotion on my auspicious qualities then engage yourself in love with love in devotional activities that are performed for the sake of pleasing me even by performing such activities gradually you will be able to achieve repeated remembrance of my auspicious qualities and then achieve steady focus in meditating on me and then attain me okay so how this translation is, is so what he is saying here is if you cannot do that abhyasa contemplate on me during routine activities of life then engage yourself in devotional activities so he elaborates that by saying that cleaning the temple making all the navavidha bhakti which is there so that he brings in 12.10 he is engage yourself in this navavidha bhakti and he says by doing it what will happen by doing it now you get training that okay so somebody may say are by doing ordinary routine activities in the world i can't think of krishna so then like like arjuna right arjuna is fighting sometimes we hear this na that arjuna is fighting even when he is fighting and shooting he is thinking of krishna that time also how can we think of krishna like that so then we may not be able to do that so the answer is you engage in mat karma parma bhava you do devotional activities directly for krishna and then that time though you have to think of krishna only suppose you are cleaning the temple or you are uh, singing for him or whatever you do for the lord then at that time without a doubt one has to think about krishna by doing that 
then the ordinary course of action also you will be able to remember me and during ordinary course of action by remembering me you can completely focus on me and meditate on me alone that is the 12 point tikka so like that he says so there is a slight difference here but broadly as prabhupada says also here in ramanujari's commentary also verse number 8 9 and 10 are all about bhakti yoga only now somebody may say that even bhakti yoga i cannot do then what happens then he says there is karma yoga so krishna brings now karma yoga also ramanujari says 12.10 was the end of bhakti yoga description 8 9 and 10 are the description of how to do bhakti yoga somebody says i can't do bhakti yoga no problem come back to karma yoga ate dadati saktos asaktosi kartu madhyoga mashrita sarva karma phalatyagam tatak kuru yatat if you are unable to perform such activity like for the enjoyment of bhagavan which are the first steps leading to bhakti yoga then with a controlled mind engage in performance of your daily and occasional duties and dedicate it to bhagavan without being attached to the fruits of such duty so here please note the bhagavan is is a broader understanding of god right like even karma yoga also there is a concept of bhagavan but that bhagavan includes all living entities it includes everything right that means uh, it, it doesn't it is not restricted only to the personal uh, feature of god it it kind of uh, you know like prakriti or some other uh, human beings like that it, it's it's a very broader uh, understanding right? so here bhagavan is not that personal uh, god etc but it is like that. so he says that if you cannot uh, so so this is for whom this is for those who cannot do bhakti yoga why he cannot do because such a person cannot he is he is uh, he somehow is not attracted enough to the lord so because of that what does krishna say go back to jnana yoga and karma yoga jnana yoga is what controlled mind yatatma va with you should have a controlled mind and engage yourself in your daily activities but don't enjoy the result at least do phalatyaga phalatyaga is mandatory you know give up the result like prabhupada says give it to somebody that somebody is that broader understanding of bhagavan which includes all living entities that means just give it to somebody and don't enjoy everything yourself okay so this is also a uh, now the last verse 12.12 and this is a very very brilliant verse because generally i always had a problem in understanding 12.12 i felt this verse a little confusing but ramanacharya's explanation is brilliant so please pay attention last 5 minutes श्रेयो हि ज्ञानम अभ्यासात ज्ञाना ध्यानं विशिष्यते ज्ञाना कर्म फलत्याग त्यागा शांतिरनंतर ओके सो नाउ आई एम नॉट इवन गोइंग टू रीड द ट्रांसलेशन आई विल जस्ट फोकस ऑन द वर्ड्स ओनली श्रेयो हि ज्ञानम अभ्यासात मींस बेटर देन ज्ञान श्रेयो हि ज्ञानम अभ्यास ज्ञान मींस बेटर देन अभ्यास कृष्ण से ठीक है ना एंड दैट मींस व्हाट बेटर देन अभ्यास इज ज्ञान Jnana dhyanam vishishyate. Better than jnana is dhyanam, and better than dhyana is karma phalatyaga. Somebody may say, "Arey, this is totally confusing," because please try to see from twelve point eight what happened. In twelve point eight, Krishna said, "Do complete dhyana only." Remember that? Maya va mana das. Then twelve point nine, Krishna said, "Do abhyas." Then twelve point ten, Krishna said, "Work for me." And then in twelve point eleven, what did Krishna say? Do karma yoga. He, he, this is the thing. He, now he is saying, uh, better than abhyasa is jnana. Are how come better than abhyasa was that jnana, na? And and so so it looks a little confusing. So what Ramana Jare says, are this verse has to be seen in the context of twelve point eleven. Twelve point eleven was for whom? Twelve point eleven was a person who is not interested in bhakti. Such a person ke liye what was said that do karma yoga. No, such a person who is there, who is uh, you know not interested in bhakti yoga and who is actually fit for karma yoga, you have to tell him. You have to tell him. So it's like you know somebody who is actually qualified. So let's say somebody is uh, you know twenty year old, twenty five year old. He has not gone to college. Yet. Okay, as such, oh, he has not done his education. Okay, so we all know that generally education is what first you do ten standard, then twelve standard, then you do bachelor's, master's, and finally PhD. We all know that PhD is the topmost position to be obtained in education. 
but what do we tell such a person such a person even though he is 25 year old he has never gone to school college we will tell him are it is best for you to do bench strength we may tell him correct we may tell him that don't uh, you know so because he is 25 year old we will tell him that no you have to start from bench strength only that is only good for so similarly krishna is using that type of a logic to tell the unqualified person who is not qualified for bhakti not interested in bhakti that don't try for something too high okay this abhyasa is that uh, very very uh, you know abhyasa is something very difficult for him so better than so now look at the translation i'll read it better than struggling with the practice of frequent remembrance of bhagavan the earlier step of jivatma direct perception atma sakshyatar gnanam is that actually gnanam is lesser than abhyasa remember right gnana is lesser than abhyasa but krishna is saying gnana is shreya shreyo hi gnanam abhyasa gnanam is better so in what context it is it is from the perspective of such a person such a person who is incompetent in practicing bhakti because that was said nine twelve point eleven for such a person krishna is saying are don't struggle with this abhyasa you cannot do this better do atma sakshatkar and better than atma sakshatkar when imperfectly formed now look at the translation better than struggling with the practice of frequent remembrance of bhagavan without love for it so somebody is artificially trying are let me do abhyas only are you are not competent only for that why you want you, you are not qualified you are struggling so much is the earlier step of atma sakshatkar gnanam is atma sakshatkar sakshatkar right if you recall so so if you recall what, what are the steps first is karma yoga correct right? after karma yoga there is basically atma dhyana atma dhyana means meditating on the self and from there there is atma sakshatkar that is like a gnana yoga platform and then there is paramatma realization and then finally one starts becoming a devotee okay so krishna is saying that the, for a person who is incompetent to do the higher level for him krishna is saying better than struggling with frequently trying to remember bhagavan without any love for him and struggling better do the earlier step of gnana which is what atma sakshatkar and better and somebody now somebody may try to do atma sakshatkar but he will be totally incompetent in that so better than doing this atma sakshatkar imperfectly is meditating on the real nature of jivatma so here the dhyanam dhyanam vishishyate with krishna is saying this this is not the dhyanam of the 12.8 that 12.8 dhyan was very high level dhyan that is dhyana on krishna directly that is not what krishna is saying here right krishna is talking about this dhyanam in terms of the sixth chapter of bhagavad gita sitting and meditating on the on the atma dhyanam and dhyana now somebody may not even be good at meditation on jivatma simply sitting like a hypocrite and trying to meditate on jivatma but cannot do karma phalatya practice performing the ordained activities but renounce it and dedicate it ध्यानात कर्म फल त्याग वाय त्याग शांति अनंतर दिस फर्स्ट स्टेप व्हिच इज द फर्स्ट स्टेप दिस कर्म फल त्याग द फर्स्ट स्टेप ऑफ परफॉर्मिंग डिसइंटरेस्टेड एक्शन डिसइंटरेस्टेड मींस डूइंग थिंग्स बिकॉज़ दे शुड बी डन एंड गिविंग अप द फ्रूट प्यूरीफाइज द माइंड एंड विल टेक यू अपवर्ड्स सो रामानुजारे सेज दिस वर्स हैज टू बी सीन लाइक दैट आई थॉट इट्स अ वेरी गुड एक्सप्लेनेशन बिकॉज़ दिस काइंड ऑफ रिकंसाइल्स व्हाटएवर वी सॉ अर्लियर सो so basically krishna is addressing the unqualified person telling that don't simply try to do in bhung of uh, higher levels of bhakti when you are not competent for it right if you are finding that difficult and you are doing that imperfectly go back to the previous step go back to the previous step. so these are all previous steps and the lowest step is what karma phalatya give up the results of your actions to somebody okay that is the starting of karma yoga the understanding of bhagavan is very abstract over there so give it up to somebody so that you are now well situated and then you will come up then you will come up in rivers you will start doing jnana then you will come to atma sakshatkar and then you will understand parmatma and then now you will start getting you can easily think of it so so this is how he explains i thought it's a very interesting explanation so we spend some time on right now from the 13th verse onwards we will do next correct any question or comment yes bhai bhavan you had a question yeah dhanwad pro ji a wonderful explanation uh, for the 12.3 and 4 pro ji again uh, ramanujacharya's translations are directed towards jivatman 
and Prabhupada's translations are directed towards uh, Bhagavan, I mean Supreme Lord. No, no, no. Prabhupada's translations are not. Peto Aksaram Anir Deshyam. Prabhupada talks about impersonal Brahman. Prabhupada yes. So, I mean, you know, Jivatman and impersonal Brahman, these are two different things, yes? Very different. See, the impersonal Brahman is the framework where this Jivatma who wants Kaivalya Mukti goes into. Try to understand that. But the Jivatman who is who is practicing the monist path, the path, the, the mark, one of the aspects of uh, sadhana for him is to meditate on himself. So Ramanujaya focuses on that. See, he wants Brahman, doesn't mean he's meditating on Brahman. See, Brahman meditation means what? Koi has a Brahman meditation. Technically speaking, there is nothing like that. Those who are aspiring for the Brahman, na, they meditate on the, uh, the akshara, the the pure soul, they are meditating on that only. Like Patanjali talks about that only. And almost all impersonals also talk about that. Who are aspiring for it. You understood me? So that is where the difference is. But one may say the difference is superficial because ultimately Prabhupada is also saying the same thing. That means that's their goal. So, you know, they are meditating. So that's like a so, so does that mean uh, meditating on oneself, the Atman uh, or the impersonal Brahman is same thing? Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. Okay, okay. And Prabhuji, there are also a series of verses where similar things are said. I mean, you know, if you cannot do this, then do this, this. Which chapter is that? I have forgotten that series. This was, see, in Jnana, that means uh, in 2.55 Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna started talking about Sthita Prajna, then 2.5, uh, 6, 7, 8, those four verses were there. Okay. About Stita Pragnya Stadochade, if you remember, right? Dukkeshana uh, Vignamana, 2.55, 2.56, 2.57, 2.51, 2.52, 2.53, 2.54, 2.55, 2.56, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.60, 2.61, 2.62, 2.63, 2.64, 2.65, 2.66, 2.67, 
and most likely he will die. I mean, and we have cases like that. Where, like, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> So that is why, so see, you cannot destroy the body also. So now Dhruva did it without destroying. So if you are not able to do, for you it is tamasic. See, that's what, na? The whole idea of success or the ideal path, there is nothing like a standardized version of it. It all depends on who you are. Like here also Krishna is saying in 12.12, if you are not competent for this, do the previous level. Why do you want to simply make a show? That's what he's saying. If you are not competent, do the previous level. So it is very individualistic. What is uh, tamasic and uh, ultimately leading to destruction for uh, someone? For Dhuva Maharaj, it is not like that. Yeah. yeah. And how do you see the training which goes in ISKCON today? Like, uh, you know, you know, collecting group of devotees and then putting them in a certain, uh, you know, certain. Uh, a rigorous uh, or certain very good uh, standards of bhakti and then uh, you know making them everybody do the same thing how do you how do you see that uh, there is no issue about telling people that this is what a path is but I think uh, where one uh, thing we could accommodate is if we see that somebody is unable to do something then to give them some other path of uh, practice or you know, which he can actually follow or see. I believe we, we, we need to go towards that. Currently, for example, by and large, we have a standardized approach for anybody who comes to us. Right? Like, uh, you understand the point, right? So, we, we don't have, uh, we don't have so much. I mean, even if we see levels, it's basically, we want them to quickly come to the so-called topmost level. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. So, to the extent we will have that, to the extent we will be able to have more people connected to us, kind of. Yeah, so I, I think in India, we are not having such a problem because still people are submissive. But uh, this is a very big challenge in the West where to get people to be committed to the basic practices, what we expect everyone to do, is quite a challenge, especially for Western born people. Yeah. So, how this 16 round, sorry, uh, your last thing, how this, uh, you know, four regulative principle, 16 rounds, can somebody say that you do a karma yoga, you know, give yeah, up the results? We don't have that. We don't have that as a part. Even 16, we, we right? like I always say that we don't have anybody starting 15 rounds or 14 or 12. Because anybody who does that, ultimately he has to come to 16 only. Otherwise, that's not kind of, you may not even have interest in that person or follow up that person too much. So, I think uh, as a moment, we'll have to think about it. I mean, we are too much, too small and insignificant to comment on that. As a moment, you'll have to think, especially in places where, uh, you know, there is more diversity and uh, there's kind of challenges in common man to accept as high levels of stuff. India is still a place where people are accepting. So, that's why we are continuing with that strategy. Some people feel that in some years, India will also become like the West. Time will tell what will happen. Okay, thank you, Bro. Hari. Damodar Ashtampu, you had something? Uh, yes, Bro. Uh, I, actually, I missed uh, some part, so I just wanted to uh, just reconfirm. Uh, this, uh, you said that 12.8, 9, and 10, na? these are uh, related to Bhakti. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, it, uh, and 11 is for those who cannot uh, uh, take yoga. Krishna as, yeah. So, Karma yoga means you do uh, activities and you offer results to. Yeah, you just give up uh, results to somebody, some abstract concept of Bhagavan. That means. Okay, like somebody is doing social service or uh, he is not utilized. Yeah, but to somebody. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So this uh, uh, second uh, 12.9, uh, is it related to somebody who is able to do uh, throughout his day uh, some activity related to. Uh, Bhakti? Yeah, is that no, what we mean? Damanacharya, the way he defines 12.9 is a little different. He says 12.9 means abhyasa means he says you have trained your mind in such a way that even in ordinary, doing ordinary routine word, you are able to think of this. That is abhyasa. So he says, see, 12.10 he says is coming to a temple, worshipping Krishna, you know, the acts of bhakti. 
where it is more easier to think about krishna na see normally where is it easy to think about krishna in a temple or when you are doing some routine activity anybody will say in temple only so ramanuja says that is the beginning of bhakti you come to temple or you connect to the deity of krishna or you chant his name and you experience bhakti but he says from there you need to come to 12.9 where even while doing ordinary activities in your life abhyasa you should be able to think of krishna when you can do that then only you can eventually come to 12.8 where continuously you are thinking about krishna you know with you are living in krishna always so he says that is he defines it like that uh no, actually i still am not understanding uh, first first is that you are able to think about krishna continuously you can think also it is related to thinking only right, there is a difference in the first thing you are not doing anything else you are only thinking okay. mayeva manadacha may buddhim nivesha nivesheshe si mayeva there is nothing else over there that means it okay. is that sometimes we have examples na we hear about some devotee who was engrossed in love of god he was uh, you know not thinking of anything he was not doing anything else also that means all his senses also stop working in a material way okay. he is uh, not doing anything but everybody will not feel that easy na they will say that are i want some personal engagement man i want to you know go out to something so krishna says okay no problem do abhyas when you are doing ordinary things also keep thinking about me hey like krishna says na think of me and fight and fight okay ಕಾಂಟೆಂಟ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಟ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಟ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಟ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಟ್ಸ್ಟ್
Uh, you do the activities and think of Krishna and 12 point eight also we are saying almost similar. No, 12 point eight we are not saying that. 12 point eight. 12 point nine 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 nine. Nine, I said that, but in twelve point eight, you are not doing any activities other than. Anyway, twelve point eight is the highest state that I understood, but twelve point nine and ten, uh, it it is appearing like similar uh, explanation. It is in na. In ten, you are doing things for Krishna and thinking about him. Which is more easy, doing things for Krishna that time remembering him, or doing routine things and still remembering Krishna. Doing routine things and remembering Krishna is more difficult, na? Because that getting... is twelve point nine. Yeah, that is it's along with. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, along with doing uh, your daily activities, you are still able to remember That's Krishna. Still okay. supposed to remember Krishna. As a matter of fact, that means externally you are doing something else only, but your consciousness in Krishna. Okay, okay, okay. Understood. It is more difficult, na? Than mm -hmm. it is easier to worship the deity and think about Krishna. What is the problem? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Also, oh, that mom, mom, yudha, mom, anusmara yudha, sir, that is twelve point nine platform. That is more difficult. That's how he explained. Yeah. It's a little different explanation, but it makes. Okay. Ha. Huh, that's what means. What the way uh, Prabhupada's Bhagavad explained that is different that is than different. what we. Yeah. That is different. It's a slightly different. Okay. 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 Thank you. Prabhupada ki the door was open.